Which section was that, Dave? Okay. 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 <clears throat> Mine might not be exactly the same numbers as yours, but it should be a similar problem. I don't think it makes much difference which way you do this. Okay, it says find the derivative of the following function. So I'm going to copy down and then switch over. And the function is y equals negative 5 in the numerator over... 4x to the fifth plus 1 raised to the third power. Well, there's actually two ways we could do this. One way is actually easier than the other, but since this is in the section about um, chain rule, the chain rule is going to be involved either way, actually. We could do it as a quotient problem. But it might be simpler, since we're already faced with the chain rule anyway, to rewrite y this way. With a negative power. At least that would eliminate the quotient rule problem. So if we do that, then dy dx is going to be the derivative of this negative 3 power with a negative 5 in front of it. So we're going to bring that negative 3 power down as a multiplier, keep the negative 5, keep the parentheses, but then we're going to reduce that power by 1, and minus 3 minus 1 is minus 4. And then we need to multiply by the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. And the derivative of what's inside the parentheses is 5 times 4 is 20, x to the 5 minus 1 is 4 for the fourth power, and the derivative plus 1 is 0, so we don't even need to write that down. And usually when I do this kind of problem, if it's a chain rule problem, if it's because there's parentheses with a power outside, I don't even write down the stuff inside the parentheses because it's actually the parentheses that I'm taking the derivative of. I'm not taking the derivative of what's inside in that first step. And then in my second step, then I go ahead and do that derivative and plug it in because it's more, uh, it looks like it's a little more organized to me to do it that way. Now at this point, you can actually plug that answer in. And it should give you credit for that answer. So we're going to see if it will. So we've got negative 3 times negative 5 times 4x to the 5th plus 1 
and that's raised to the power negative four. And then we need to close that other parenthesis and open a new one for the derivative of four x to the fifth plus one, which is 20 x to the fourth. Okay. If you will do the first step and you do the first step correctly, you don't have to do all that extra algebra to simplify. Now, if it were to be a multiple choice question where it says find the derivative and then it gives you A, B, C, D, put your answer in Y1 in the calculator and then put, e, put the choice one at a time in Y2 and graph, and if you see the same graph on both of them, well, it's the right answer, they match. If you see two graphs, then they're not equal and therefore that's not the right answer. So you can still check it that way. Okay. And if you, I mean, I don't know where to stop. I mean, because I'm so confused on what you say and what they expect. And I know they don't, but when I think you the example, mm -hmm. and I mean, I, I, I did it, like you said, and you're right. I mean, you're, you're telling us right, because if you could stop here, but the other one had you They all have you go all the way. Four more steps. Yes. And the thing, so but I, that's not. Like I get confused of how, where can you stop. You can, if, as long as you do out that first step correctly, stop. We can stop. Okay. Stop. Okay. And it does, like I say, it does take it. In my step, I, you're right. I didn't believe it, but it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it it does. doesn't matter how ugly it looks. Yeah, it does. It, it does. And what I'm looking for, what I'm looking for, folks, is that you can do. Set it up. You can set it up. You can do the calculus, because the algebra is not the point. The point is set it up and get the derivative, and if you can feed that derivative into your calculator and plug a number into it, you're gonna be able to apply it, and that's all that matters, okay? So don't beat yourself up doing a whole lot of algebra. Because the next one, David, on that, I mean, you really don't have to go far and do much at all. Actually, nothing like what it says in Y2, but it says you can do the same Okay, now this one is a little more complicated. This one we have a quotient rule problem, R of t is equal to, the numerator is 7t minus 6, and it's been raised to the 6th power, so that's going to be chain rule, and the denominator is 3t, 3t squared plus 2. So when we find r prime of t, I'm just going to slide the first problem up out of the way. When I, do, uh, when I do quotient rule problems, I'll go straight out from the numerator and go ahead and take the derivative of the numerator and just call it n prime. And since it's chain rule, that's going to be 6 times the parentheses raised to the fifth power times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses, which is just 7, and then write 7t minus 6 back inside the parentheses, and there's my derivative, and I'm done. Then I'm going to do the same thing with the denominator. I'm going to take the derivative. I'll just go right over next to it and write d prime. And the derivative of 3t squared is 2 times 3 is 6t to the first power, and the derivative of 2 is 0. And then I know that the way that I take the derivative of a quotient is going to be denominator times the numerator squared plus the numerator, I'm sorry, not plus, minus, 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 minus minus the numerator times the denominator derivative over the denominator squared. 
So R prime of T is equal to the denominator, which is 3T squared plus 2. times the derivative of the numerator. And you could simplify it if you want to by saying six times seven is 42. If you wanna save that extra set of parentheses, that's okay. You know, when I see something that's fairly easy to do, I'll go ahead and do it, just to save typing. Well, you put it down just a Hmm? You the paper down just Like that? And then 7t minus 6 is in the parentheses, and that's to the fifth power. And the only reason I did that was to avoid a bunch of extra parentheses. I didn't have to. And then that's going to be minus the numerator, which is 7t minus 6 to the sixth power times the derivative of the denominator, which is 6t. And then that whole thing is over the denominator squared. And the only thing here you're going to have to be careful of is because you do have a rational expression, your whole numerator needs to be enclosed in an extra set of parentheses or brackets or something. It needs to be grouped so that it actually does the division into the whole numerator. That's an order of operations issue. But once you get that far, that should be enough. That's the gist of it, yes. I'm going to try to get this to where I can get them side by side and type it in so y'all can keep, keep writing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think this is going to be one of those times it doesn't. Stop that. Okay, so this is the numerator. Parentheses 3t squared plus 2 times 42 time, whoops, times 17 minus 6 to the fifth power and then close those, whoops, close those parentheses Subtract 7t minus 6. You have a 6 Ah, uh, I see that. Thank you. To the power 6. Ah. Uh, right? No, it should be 6 times 6t. And at that point, my numerator's finished, so I'm going to close that bracket. That's, that's all I know. That's my whole numerator. And now divided by, in parentheses, 3t squared
that in a box. You hateful thing. Okay, trust me, I'll get it in there and then I'll put it up there. And that's also squared. So there's my denominator without my T, darn it. Sometimes I really don't like you in my math lab. Okay, so hopefully I topped it all in right. Check the answer, and it's happy with that. Okay, get through your first step. That's the calculus. Everything after that's just algebra. And I would just assume you not have to work that hard. Because for one thing, it's far too easy to make a little teeny tiny arithmetic mistake. And by the time you get to the end of the problem, you have no clue where you went wrong because it doesn't even resemble what they have. So if you get that first step in there, you should be okay. Any others? This one? The derivative of f of g of x at x equals 2. First of all, you need to find the derivative. You first of all need to find what g of x is at x equals 2. So at x equals 2, g of x is equal to two. And then you need to find, okay, then what is f of two? Well, that's one. And the derivative of one is... Yeah. It's kind of like working a puzzle. It's making you think about what is the inside and then what's the next, what's the outside. And then at x equals 4, first you go see where is f of x equal to 4. It's 4. So then what's g of 4? It's 1. So then what's the derivative of g of x at 1, 2 fifths? Oops, apparently not. Or did I misread it? Let's see f of x is f of 4, which is 4. If you put 4 into g, you get 1. Ah, and then g prime is 1 fifth, not 2 fifths. Now, f of x is the inside, so f of 4 is here. So g of 4 is 1. And then you're doing the derivative, g prime, which should be 1 fifth. Wait a minute, I'll wait, let me think. It is the derivative of g times the derivative of f, which is one fifth times negative four, so it's negative four fifths.
Okay. That's what I didn't do. I did it in my head on the other one, but I didn't do it on this one. So it's that inner function, and then it's times the, times the time derivative of the, the derivative of the outer, and then right. times the derivative uh, of the, of the inner. Yeah, you have to find okay. both. Did you say 16? Yeah. Find the, okay, now this is one that a lot of people missed on the test. So everybody take good notes on this one. It's worth, worth doing this one, really. It says, find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of the given function at the given value of x. When you're finding the equation of a tangent line, I'm just going to copy down the function and then explain. Keep in mind that the equation of a tangent line is going to look like that, y equals mx plus b. So what you're trying to find first is the slope, okay? And the slope is the derivative of the function. That's one of the main lessons from chapter 11. The slope is the derivative of the function. Whether it's a graph or whatever, it's the derivative of the function. Slope and derivative are the same thing. So first of all, we have to have f prime of x. And f prime of x is a product. And the derivative of its first factor is 2. And the derivative of its second factor is a chain rule. 7 times what's in the parentheses raised to the sixth power times the derivative of what's in the parentheses, which is 2x minus 4 plus 0, which we won't write down. So when we take f prime, we're going to take 2x times the derivative of the second factor, which is 7 times x squared minus 4x minus, or excuse me, plus 5 to the 6th power times 2x minus 4. And then we're going to add to that the second factor. times the derivative of the first one, which is just 2. Now, you can be tempted to simplify all you want to, but I guarantee you, even if I try to do it, I'm probably going to mess up too, at least the first time through. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my calculator. And I'm going to go to y equals, and I'm going to enter in that function exactly the way that I wrote it.
I'm going to check very carefully that I kept all the parentheses, put everything in the right place, didn't mess anything up. So 2x in parentheses times 7 times x squared minus 4x plus 5 in parentheses to the 6th power times 2x minus 4 in parentheses plus x squared minus 4x plus 5 in parentheses to the 7th power times 2. And it will do the exponent before it does the multiplication. Then I'm going to go back to the home screen and you can do this two different ways. You can either go bars, y bars, function y1, put parentheses and put the 2 in the parentheses because it says at x equals 2 and hit enter and it says that evaluates to be 2. Or if you want to go to the table and make sure it's set up to ask, If you entered in 2, it would say 2, and it already had 2 in that table, so it's 2, whichever way you want to do it. So the slope of my function is 2. So when you find the derivative, like that, you get your answer, that's the slope. That's the slope. Okay. That one was pretty easy to work out So now I know that the slope is 2, okay? But I also need an x and a y value. That I do not have just yet. I have one, but I don't have the other. It says that x equals 2, but I have y equals mx plus b, and I need a y value. So to get a y value, I go back and find f of 2. So f of 2 is 2 times 2. And that's in the original. In the original. 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 5 raised to the 7th power. And I'm still going to use my calculator to do that. I'm not going to do that in my head either. But I'm just going to go to the home screen and do it. So... Two times two times two squared minus four times two plus five, close parentheses, raise it to the seventh power, hit enter, and f of two is equal to four. So that equals y, and y equals mx plus b. So now I'm ready to write an equation of the tangent line. I know everything I need to know. y is equal to 4 equals the slope, which is equal to 2 times x, which is 2, plus b. I don't know, but I can find it out because it's the only thing I don't know. So 2 times 2 is 4, and if I minus 4 on both sides, that tells me that b is equal to 0. So the equation of the tangent line is y equals 2x. Okay? And that's always the way you find the equation of a tangent line. You find your slope by taking the derivative, then you plug the x value you're given into the, sl into the derivative to get your slope, and you plug it back into the original function to get your y value. 
and then use y equals mx plus b. Any other questions before we go on? Okay, before I actually start with 12.4 and 12.5, let me show you where you can look in Shobi for me to be able to answer questions for you. Somehow, I have managed to put two folders in Chapter 12 uh, with homework questions. I don't remember which one I put the post in, so let's see. There's one in there. And there's one in there. I bet I put both of them in yours and not the other one, but we'll see. Okay. Okay. This one is um, an explanation about marginal average revenue. That was something a lot of people missed on the test, was, was or not, not on the test, now that I think about it. They missed this on the Shobi. One of the Shobi assignments asked you about finding marginal average cost. Okay, marginal average cost is that you have to find the average before you do the derivative. So this is what I, what the show me looks like. Let's see if I can get some sound. Cost, revenue, or profit function. The first thing you have to find here is going to be the average revenue. And average revenue is given by, all right, with a bar over the top of X, which is the revenue function, R of X divided by X. Sometimes it's simpler, depending on the revenue function, to instead take R of X times 1 over X. But in this case, we're going to use the quotient rule because this one is easier to deal with using the quotient rule. So in order to find R prime of X, we're going to take R average of X which is 10,000 times 1 minus x over 600 squared, and we're going to divide that by x. And because this is a quotient rule, then we're going to need the derivative of the numerator. which is going to be, bring the power down in front of parentheses, so that's 2 times the 1,000 makes that 2,000, times the parentheses, moves the power by 1, so that's going to be the first power, and then multiply by what's inside the parentheses derivative, and the derivative of 1 is 0, and the derivative of one six hundred x is one times one six hundred, or just leave it over six hundred. And x to the one minus one is going to be um, x to the zero. So we're just going to be left with the one over six hundred. And then filling in what's in the parentheses, again, is 1 minus x over 600. And then simplifying as much as we can, 2,000 2, times 1 is 2,000. Minus 2,000 over 600. Um, 
times x. It's multiplied all of this by 0 minus 1 over 600, or just 1 over 600. Now, the easiest way to distribute this 1 over 600 is to take the 2,000, put it over the 600, minus the 2,000x, times 1 over 600, while well, itself is over 600, that's going to be over 600 squared. And then eliminating some zeros here, we have 20 over 6 minus 600 squared is 3600. Oh, excuse me, 360,000, not 3,600. So these three zeros will take away those three zeros. And we have 2 over 360, which would be 1x over 180. So this is in prime. And then, of course, the denominator is x, so d prime is going to be just 1. So in order to take the actual derivative, our prime of x, which is our goal, our average prime, we take the denominator, which is x, times the derivative of the numerator, which is 20 over 6 minus x over 180 minus the numerator, which is 1,000 times 1 minus x over 600 squared times the derivative of the denominator, which is 1. And that's all divided by x squared. And while we can simplify that and clean it up quite a bit, at this point we can also leave it just like it is. If we were given a number to plug into it, we would simply plug in that number at this point. So remember, the key to this problem is when it asks for marginal, there is going to be a derivative involved but the derivative is of the average cost, revenue, profit, whatever, which means you first have to take that function and divide it by x. And hopefully that helps you. So there's, that's the best way that I can answer questions for you. The only issue is I can't show you the calculator steps in those kind of things. But I can certainly show you every step on every problem. And most of the people that have looked at those, at those say they really help. And it's better for me to try to do that than integrity because integrity at home, I don't have any way to write. And you don't want me writing on uh, a computer screen with a mouse because you'll never be able to read it. I do those on the iPad. It's much easier. So there's another good source of help for you. So we should be ready at this point then to go to which is derivatives of exponential functions.
So, one of the things I want you to pay careful attention to is the fact that you're going to see an E in these problems, and E is not a variable. E is a number. It's a number just like pi is a number. It's an irrational number. It's approximately 2.718281828, and it does repeat. It arises in a lot of applications, such as continually compounded interest, which you saw last semester when we did finance. And it can be defined as the limit as m approaches, uh, approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over m raised to the m power. Not that that really is all that important. What we're interested in is how do you take derivatives of exponential functions. And most people usually when they get to this part will say, well, taking derivatives of the exponential function with e is the easiest one there is because guess what? It's, it's um, derivative. It is its derivative. So the derivative of e to the x power is e to the x power. It doesn't change when you take its derivative. However, if the base is not e, if the base is a different number, like 3 or 5 or 9, then the derivative of whatever that is to the x power will be the natural logarithm of that number times that number raised to the x power. Now, the reason that it doesn't work that way with e to the x Take a little side trip here for a second. It really does work that way with e to the x. It just doesn't immediately jump out at you why it does. But the reason that the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x is because when you take the natural logarithm, which is this button down here next to the number four, there's your natural logarithm button. If you take the natural logarithm of e, and that's the second natural log, and raise that e to the first power, because anything to the first power is just itself, it tells you the answer is 1. So the natural logarithm of e is 1. And in this problem, that 1 sits in front of the e to the x, and it doesn't do anything so we don't write it down. But now if you were to take something like 3 to the x power, the natural logarithm of 3, sorry, is not 1. It is something other than 1. And in this particular case, for example, I probably need to let x be 1. Uh, help if I did it in the right order. So now if I ask it what's x, it says x is 1. So if I say, well, okay, then what's 3 raised to the x power, well, that's just 3 to the first power, which is 3. But the natural logarithm of 3, once again, is 1.09 something. Okay? But the natural log of e is 1, and that's why it appears that in this it has disappeared. There really is a 1 there because the natural log of e is equal to 1. So it's really the same rule. It's just special for e because this part had, kind of disappears. Now, they also work, same similar rules work, if it happens that your power is itself a function, which makes it chain rule. 
okay? All that means is you're gonna take basically this same derivative, either e to the x or ln a times a to the x, and then you're gonna multiply it by the derivative of the power. That's all you have to do at the end to make it, to make it work with everything else. So we're gonna do some examples here. And I'd rather do them on paper than on the PowerPoint. So if you have questions, I can take care of them more easily. So the first one says, find the derivative of e to the 5x power. Well, the derivative of e to any power is e to that power. But because the power is itself a function five times x, we multiply it by five because that's the derivative of five x. And generally we write the five in front. Because it's a coefficient, we're just used to writing coefficients in the front. But when we come to s is equal to 3 to the t power, s prime is going to be the natural log of 3 times 3 to the t power. And since the derivative of t is 1, then even if we multiply it by 1, it stays the same. This one just happens to have a coefficient. y equals 10e to the 3x squared power. Now one thing you do need to notice is that the 3x squared power is indeed a function, so it has a derivative. Its derivative is 6x. We're gonna to need to use that 6x. But y prime is going to be 10 times e to the 3x squared power times the derivative, which is 6x, the derivative of the power. And once again, it's usually written with this part back out in the front. So 10 times 6 is 60x e to the 3x squared. The last one is very similar to this one. The only difference is we have to realize that again, here we've got a power and it's, its power is one over t. And one over t is equal to t to the negative one. So when we take the derivative of t to the negative one, that's gonna wind up being negative t to the negative two. But then the rest of this just pretty much follows along like it is, except you need the natural log of 10. So I have 8 ln 10 times 10, and you can either call that t to the one, negative 1 power or 1 over t, whichever one you want to. And that's s prime. And you can rearrange the terms if you want to. You could write it 
as 8, in fact, put the negative here in front, negative 8, ln 10, t to the negative 2 times 10 to the t to the negative 1 if you want to, or 1 over t. It doesn't matter. That's all the same. Now, if you watch the textbook, you ask them for their explanations, they're going to go one more step. I'll promise you they'll go one more step. Sometimes they always, sometimes they get too carried away. You can actually multiply 8 times the natural log of 10 and get a number, a single number. But there's nothing wrong with negative 8 natural log of 10. Well, I just leave it that way. Okay? There's, there should be. Let me check and make sure there actually is a button for the natu natural log. I haven't done that in a while. Let me make sure there's actually one there. Because it seems like we had to hunt for it the last time we were doing these. Okay, let's do this one. Then I'll try to check my answer. <clears throat> so we have y equals negative 10. Raised to the 8x squared power. Or 8x squared minus 1 power. So what the rules tell me to do, my base is negative 10. So that's the natural log of negative 10 times negative 10 to the 8x squared minus 1 power times the derivative of 8x squared minus 1 is 16x. Now, here's where we're going to run into a problem. You can't take the natural log of negative 10. It's not a real number. And that's what it's trying to tell me that when I told it to go to is that I can't do that. So for that one, I'm kind of glad I accidentally picked this one because it's going to be good to make it show you how to fix that. I'm just going to make it solve this one rather than go through the stepping through.
the value of A in ln Y is negative 8, but they're using positive 8. Okay? Even though it says negative 8. I'm going to see if they tell you why you have to use negative 8. Okay, they do. The derivative is going to be uh, negative because the original function is multiplied by the constant negative 1. Okay? So we're going to have to back out. And let me show, show you how we're going to get around this. So we're not going to be able to take the derivative of negative 10. What we're going to do is we're going to look at this function that we had as being negative 1 times 10 to the 8x squared minus 1 which means then that y prime is going to be negative 1 times the derivative. And the derivative is going to be the natural log of 10 times 10 to the 8x squared minus 1, which is exactly what we did before, times 16x. If you want to put the negative 1 together with the 16x, it would be negative 16x ln 10 times 10 to the 8x squared minus 1 power, and it should take that just fine. So I'm glad I picked that one because you would have a little trouble figuring out where the negative came from in the end and why it didn't work. So it's negative 16x, and let's see where the ln is. There's your e, by the way, on this, if you need an e. Don't type an e, use the e character. And it usually does. I'm not seeing where there was an ln, so I'm thinking we can just type in ln. We'll see. Yeah, and it bold-faced it so it recognizes that's a function. So it's ln 10 parentheses 10 raised to the power 8x squared Minus 1, close parentheses, and hopefully that's the right answer. Uh, let's see. Oh, I was on a different problem now. Let me copy my answer. Oh, go away. it changed it on me now. That's all right. Yeah. Okay, well the only thing it changed was the 8. So that derivative is going to be 10x instead of 16x. So negative 10x 
parentheses, or wait, LN, LN10. times 10 raised to the power of 5x squared minus 1. Hmm? Oh, minus, yes, minus 7, thank you. Okay, so it's happy with that. So just remember, if you've got a negative in front of your LN problems or your log problems, just pull it out there like a coefficient and hold it out in the front and take the, take the log of the positive number. Okay? Let me come see. Because sometimes I have to see what it what it said. going to be subtracted from 6x squared. Okay. And you can save that. Okay. And it, then you just paste it into a document as a picture and send it to me. You can even save it and give it a name and send it as an attachment to an email. That little snipping tool is real handy. Okay, so here we've got another one, and like I said, I'm going to keep on doing these on paper because 
I think you get more out of it by seeing step by step than just seeing stuff flash up there on the PowerPoint. So this is the derivative of an exponential function, but notice now they're getting complicated. Because not only is this an exponential function, here's the exponential part of it, but you've also got a chain rule problem and the whole thing is a product. So you're going to have to use product rule, okay? Oh, sorry, forgot to hit the other button. So yes, this is exponential. This is a chain rule problem because that's the same as 5x plus 2 to the 1 half power. And this is this multiplied times that which makes it a product. So we're going to take this one step at a time. The first thing we need, we're going to call this f, and it is e to the x squared plus 1, and its derivative is e to the x squared plus 1, because the natural logarithm of e would be 1, and we don't need to put down that 1, times the derivative of x squared plus 1, which is 2x, and I just put it in the front instead of putting it behind. And then g, the second factor, we're going to write as 5x plus 2 to the 1 half power. And the thing I want to caution you about here is how do you know when something's exponential and how do you know when it's power? It's exponential if the variable is the power. It's power rule if the power is not a variable. The variable is down in the base. Okay? This power is in the base. This power is in the exponent, so that's why this is exponential and this is a power rule. But it's power rule with a chain rule because it's actually a power on a function, not just on x. So the derivative of g is going to be bring the one half down in front and then take the derivative of what's inside. Derivative of 5x squared is, I'm sorry, 5x is 5, and derivative of 2 is 0, so we won't do anything with that. And then reduce your power by 1, so that's going to be negative 1 half. And then put your guts back in your parentheses. Now we can do the product rule. So dy dx is the first function. Times the derivative of the second function. plus the second function times the derivative of the first function. And stop. There's no need to do anything else. Yes, I know it's a lot of parentheses, but the calculus is done. Extra algebra winds up giving you a headache, costing you more time, and causing you to make little mistakes 
that'll frustrate you when my math lab says, no, that's not right. I'm not going to tell you why it's not right, but it's not right. So on the PowerPoint, when they just put two X at the end instead of that, that would be Uh, yeah, I just put the two X in the front. Yeah. Yeah, when I did this, I, I knew that I was going to take this derivative times that, and I just dropped it down in front so that I wouldn't need as many parentheses. Now, if you watch the PowerPoint, every bit of the rest of that is algebra. Algebra that in every step of the way, there's the potential to make a mistake and drive you crazy. So it's there, but you don't have to do it. In fact, I'm not quite sure why they do that and then do this. I really am not. It doesn't make it look any better. So here's our next example. Realize that this is just a constant. Okay? This is not a quotient rule problem. Unless there's a variable in the numerator, it's not a quotient rule problem. You could use it as a quotient rule problem, but it just takes longer. If there's nothing but a constant in the numerator, don't use the quotient rule. Move the denominator up and make the power negative. That makes it easier to do because it becomes just a chain rule or power rule problem. So the first thing we want to do is to rewrite f of x as being 100,000 times 1 plus 100e to the negative 0.3x and then put a negative 1 power on the outside of that. It really is easier. So since this is just constant, it just rides along. The negative one comes down in front of it and makes it negative. And the negative one reduces by one and becomes a negative two. And the derivative of what's inside those parentheses is zero plus 100 because it's just a multiplier. And the derivative of e to anything is e to that thing. But because the power is a function, we need to multiply by the derivative of that power, which is just negative 0.3. That better? Sometimes it's easier just to make the screen wider. And then I'm just going to put this back in the parentheses now. Now, just for the ease of not having to write quite so many parentheses, you might clean this up a little bit. First of all, you're going to want to realize that zero really made no difference. And that this constant times this constant 
is, let's see, that's going to lop off one of those zeros and multiply it by 3. So that should be right. And then here we've got times 100 e to that power. times this to the negative 2 power. Uh -huh. Yeah, I messed up when I wrote this. This should have been 100 e to the negative 0.3x power. So I'll fix that down here. That's as much as I would do to it. I wouldn't do any more than that. I messed up in this, this step tree. Oh, we're just, we're looking at, because they did it by quotient rule, we're just looking at the two answers, trying to make sure that it was the same thing. Yeah, I, I was going to show you, you can do it by quotient rule. So if we go look at the quotient rule answer, and we'll compare these here in a second. You look at that quotient rule answer and you say, my word, that doesn't look a bit like what we got, but it really does. Let's see if I can get these side by side for a second. These really do look exactly the same because if you take this 30,000 times this 100, e to the negative 0.3x, drop this down the denominator, and make the power positive, that's exactly what they got. So it's up to you which way you do it. You can do things with the quotient rule if you want to. What drove this to actually work in the quotient rule was the fact that the derivative of the 100,000 was zero and made the first term disappear. So a lot of times you can make quotient rule problems into product rule problems if it seems easier to you to do it that way. Or if you've got a product rule that has neg negative powers, you can turn it into quotient rule if it seems easier. It just depends on which rule you think works the best for you. Everybody has different ways of looking at things. Okay? And this next thing we're going to look at is really used quite a bit in business. 
they didn't really talk about it much in the last edition of the book, which was a little frustrating because it does come up so often in business. Um, a lot of times population or sales of a certain product or you know, a lot of different things, they'll start out growing slowly and then they'll suddenly take off and grow very fast. But then they'll level off. Now in nature, the kind of thing that we would talk about is suppose that you've got um, a population of, of rabbits on an island and there was no natural predators. What happens with the rabbits? Yeah, they're overpopulating, the rabbits are going to starve. What would happen if we introduced a pair of wolves to that real, really large population of rabbits? Okay, the rabbit population is going to drop down. Then what's going to happen? It's going to level out at the bottom because eventually the rabbits and the wolves will come into equilibrium. The, the wolves will eat enough of the rabbits to keep the population in check. The wolves won't populate anymore, but neither will the rabbits. If you look at uh, before the wolves were there, the rabbits will start out if you only have maybe a pair of rabbits, but pretty soon that pair of rabbits has more rabbits, and then those rabbits have rabbits, and they grow phew. But then eventually, because they're on an island, they have a limited food source, what happens to them? They start leveling off because they don't have enough to eat. So a bunch of them die from starvation. So, you know, that's a natural example, but it's the same thing with sales products. You know, you see, somebody starts a new product, let's say it's a, in a food truck or something like that, somebody comes up with this new food truck product, and everybody's like, you know, never heard of it before. But a few people tried, and then suddenly it shows up on Instagram and Facebook and Food Network TV, and the population just grows and grows and grows. The sales are great, but are they going to keep growing forever? No, because somebody's going to come up with the next good thing. Okay? So that's called a logistic function. And this logistic function is actually used an awful lot in, uh, in business planning and analysis. And what we're looking at here is the limit as time reaches infinity is actually going to come out to be the constant in the numerator of that function. And that's because of that leveling off. So this is an example of product sales. And at this point I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint because it's easier than writing all this stuff out. This is what a logistic function looks like. It's a function of time, so time, t, is the variable. But these other, and e is also, remember, not a variable, it is actually a number. But m is a variable in the problem, and g is a variable in the problem, but they have values that will be given to you. So in this sales production, company sells 990 units of a new product in the first year, and they sell 3,213 units in the fourth year, and they expect sales can be approximated by a logistic function that levels off at about 100,000 in the long run. They would like for us to find a formula for the sales of their product as a function of time. So we're going to do that first. You know that their initial value is 990. You also know that the leveling out point that they predict is 100,000. So 100,000 is the value of M, and here's your initial point, what the logistic function calls G of zero. This is just S of zero. So you plug that in for the denominator in the logistic formula, and you plug in the constant for the numerator of both this fraction and this one. And then M also goes in to the negative uh, KMT. Now remember, E is not a variable, E is a number. So K is something we're going to have to figure out. We don't have K. They didn't give us K. 
but we can find that out because they told us that sales in the fourth year was 32.13. So we set that whole thing equal to 32.13 and we're going to solve that for K. So 32.13 in the fourth year gives us this problem. And four times 100,000 is 400,000. And that 101.01 .01 is the result of dividing 100,000 by the 990, was it? Yeah, by 990. So they just simplified that a little bit. And what they're gonna do next is they're gonna cross multiply. 32.13 over 1 means you take 32.13 times this denominator would be equal to 1 times that numerator. And then multiply through. 32.13 times 1 is 32.13. 32.13 times 100.01 is 321,332 times E raised to the power negative 4,000 K, and that's equal to 100,000. And they've subtracted the 3213 from both sides, then divided both sides by 321, 332, and e to the negative k4000 is equal to this number, and the way they find it is not the way that I would find it, because they use logarithms. They're taking the idea that you can take the natural logarithm of both sides, which you can. If you take the natural logarithm of e, to this power, what you're going to get is that power. And the natural logarithm to the other side is just a very, very small number divided by the 400,000. Now, if I were going to solve it, I would actually solve it right here. But you have to be careful how you do it if you do it in the calculator. I will go to the calculator and put in E raised to the negative X times 4,000 or 400,000. And because X in front of the number always bothers me, I'm going to move it to the end because that's just me. I like my variables after the coefficient. And then, just to prove the 96, 787 divided by the 321, 332. And then I'm gonna go, knowing that the answer is not gonna be negative, but also not going to be very big. I'm just going to go from 0 to 5 and see if I can fit a window to it without doing anything. So I'm going to go second, or excuse me, not second, I'm going to go zoom, fit. Okay, so I can tell right here that my answer is going to be on a really narrow window, so I'll go back and only go from 0 to 1. And again, I'm going to go zoom fit.
and try to find the intersection since I can tell they're intersecting. And it says it's at 2.999 E negative 6, which is what that is. So you could find it that way. K is 3 times 10 to the negative 6 power. But if you, you know, this way is fine. I know that some of you haven't worked with logarithms. You may not know about taking the natural log of both sides. But anytime you've got a problem with E, you can take the natural log of both sides if you can isolate it down to where you have E to the power is equal to a constant. Just take the natural log of both sides and you'll wind up with the power being equal to the natural log of that constant. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? Find the rate of change of sales after four years. Well, now that we know what the constant is, remember the constant was negative 0.03, then we just plug that constant in and find the derivative. So let's go back to the original problem Trying to find the one that will work the best. Okay, from right here. And do the calculus part. Because on a test, I would be unlikely to ask you to come up with a function. I would more likely give you the function and ask you to find the derivative. Now here again, you can use quotient rule. Okay. You use product rule or quotient rule either one. Actually, just the power rule. It's not even really product rule. The way I would do it is with the power rule. So then S prime of T is equal to negative 1 times 100,000 times the parentheses to the negative 2 times the derivative of what's in the parentheses. Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of 100 e to the negative 0.3 is 100 e to the negative 0.3 t times 0 0.3 for the derivative of the power. And negative 0.3 times 100 times negative 100,000 Sure. Do a little arithmetic here. Reduces that down to three million. put that back down in the denominator or you could keep it as a negative power either one and then it says find the rate of sales 
rate of change of sales after four years, you're just finding S prime of four that let's see what that would be Square that and then divide three million by that answer and get and I don't think we need the decimals for this. So the rate of change is 1,771,891 per year. So sales are still increasing at that point. They're still going pretty fast. And I hope my number matches what they got. No, it doesn't. I goofed somewhere in the arithmetic. Where did they get that derivative? Oh, I know why I goofed. I forgot to keep this. Sorry. Much better.
sell by 933 per year. Sorry about that. Got to be careful and copy everything down right. That's not likely a test question, by the way. It'd be more like a bonus question. Because the math gets a little tricky. Okay. Now, if you notice here, rate of change of sales after four years is about 933 units per year. It increasing that sales are, it indicates that sales are increasing at this time. So, you know, right about here is where four years are. But if we were to substitute in, say, 20 years, it's still increasing at a good clip. We get a lot larger number. But by the time 30 years rolls around, their sales are pretty much leveled out. And logistic functions always look that way. They start out low and then level off at a high number, or they can start out high and level off at a low number, depending on whether it's an exponential growth or an exponential decay function. But that pretty much finishes up the exponential functions. And y'all probably need to take a break, so take about 10. And I will get set up for the last section. Section. Like I told you, chapter 12 goes lots faster than chapter 11. We're going to talk about derivatives of logarithmic functions, and I want you to understand that a logarithmic function is the inverse of an exponential function. An inverse is something like a reciprocal, but not exactly. It reverses a function. So what you've got on the top of your notes is how do you find the derivative of a log function where the log is to a base that is other than E? Because E is one kind of exponential function, and then there's other bases, so we have logs of other bases, and natural log functions are the ones that have a base of E. The way you take the derivative, once again, is really the same. The only difference is that what happens here is that you wind up taking the natural log of the base and multiplying it times the denominator. But the natural logarithm of E, this is a log base E function, and the natural log of E is equal to 1, and that just doesn't change anything. So it just looks like it doesn't show up. So the way that you take the derivative of any log function is you take 1 over whatever it's the log of. Like if it's the log base A of X, then you take 1 over x, and then you multiply that by the natural log of the base. If it's the natural log of x, then it's just 1 over x, because the natural log of e is 1. So it doesn't change anything in front of the x. So we'll do a couple of examples. First of all, we've got the natural log of 6x. The natural log of 6x is 1 over 6x. But because 6x is itself a function, you're going to start wondering when does the chain rule come in? and you have to take the derivative of whatever this is. And the derivative of 6x is what? 
it's six. Okay? As long as you got just a coefficient, basically, you still wind up with 1 over x. When you see log without a base, that base is automatically assumed to be 10. If it's not 10, they have to tell you what it is. But if you don't see any base there, it's 10. So the log base 10 of x is 1 over x, but you multiply the x by, I'm sorry, not log, the natural log of 10. So y prime is equal to 1 over the natural log of 10 times x. And the natural log of 10 is just a number. You could change it to a decimal if you wanted to, but your calcul your my math lab is going to want you to actually give it as ln of 10. But just so that you understand, it is just a number. Okay? Now, it can be a little more complicated than that. You can be taking the natural log of a function, which in the one here was pretty easy, but the one here, not so easy. Because here, this derivative is not going to cancel anything out. So what we're going to do is we take the derivative of the natural log of that by taking 1 over x squared plus 1. But then we multiply it by the derivative of x squared plus 1, which is what? 2x. So it's going to be 2x over x squared plus 1. Now this one is not base 10, it's base 2. <coughs> so part of the denominator is going to be the natural log of 2. And then the derivative of the natural log of the parentheses is 1 over the parentheses. But then I have to multiply that by the derivative of what's in the parentheses, which is 6x minus 4. So the final form is going to be 6x minus 4 over natural log of 2 times 3x squared minus 4x. questions. <clears throat> now the good news here is that honestly my math lab doesn't make you simplify these as much. It doesn't try to show you all the simplifications because there's really not much you can do in most of these.
When you have absolute values, it's because you can't take the logarithm of negative numbers as we saw in the last one. So we're always going to assume that it's going to be absolute value. So this is really just a restatement of what we had a few minutes ago. What I showed you in, a, in the last one was that if you're taking the derivative of the base A logarithm of x, knowing that if x happened to be negative that you're going to have to take the absolute value of it, it's still the derivative of the log of anything is 1 over that thing times the natural log of the base. And if it's a function, then it's 1 over the natural log of the base. And the function still stays down here, but the derivative goes up on top. That's just a shortcut from what I showed you before. Okay? And this says that if you have the natural log of x, it's just 1 over x because x has to be positive. And the natural log of some function is the function's derivative over the function itself, which is what I just showed you on the previous one. So if you take the shortcuts here, the natural log of the absolute value of 5x is 1 over 5x. It winds up, however, being multiplied times, since this is 5x is actually a function of x, the derivative of 5x is 5, so it winds up being the derivative over the original function. And when you do that, you wind up with just 1 over x. So what that kind of tells you is that if x has a coefficient, its, der it's derivative kind of disappears and it's just 1 over x. Now, taking derivatives of log functions isn't hard. Basically, you're flipping them over, taking the reciprocal, and if the base of the log is an e, if it's not a natural log, then you take the natural log of whatever the base is and put it in there. And if what you're taking the log of as a function, you apply chain rule and its derivative winds up in the numerator. What you have to be careful of is to realize once again, when do you have a product? And that is a product. F is 3x. F prime is 3. G is the natural log of x squared. G prime is going to be 1 over x squared times 2 or 2 over x squared. So that when I do the product, f prime, you need to remember that it's f g prime minus g f prime. They trade derivatives. I'm sorry, it's not minus, it's plus. Minus is for quotients. So f, 3x, g prime, 2 over x squared, plus g, natural log of x squared, times f prime, we 
which is three. Now, if you want to simplify, go right ahead. But that's actually all you have to do for the calculus. The calculus is done at that stage. If you do simplify, you say three times two is six, and x takes away x squared, so that becomes six over x. And you might put the three in front of the ln x squared. So either one of those answers is acceptable, but there's nothing wrong with the first one. Any questions so far? You're ready for another one. Okay, we got a quotient rule. We can turn it into a product rule. But we're going to use it as a quotient rule because that's the way it's laid out. So for the quotient rule, well, I've got a numerator. And I need its derivative. And its derivative is going to be the natural log of 8 times the original function. I keep wanting to put an x, but it's a t. And the numerator is going to be the derivative of that. So it's going to be 3 halves. t to the 1 half plus 0 for the 1, but we're not going to write that down. So there's your numerator derivative. Whoops, made it too high. There we go. And then your denominator derivative, thank goodness, is the derivative of just t, and that's just 1. So my derivative is going to be n prime times the denominator and n times d prime. <coughs> and I'm going to subtract them. And divide by d squared. So the denominator is t. Derivative of the numerator is 3 halves t to the 1 half over natural log of 8 times t to the 3 halves plus 1 minus 1 times log base 8 of t to the 3 halves plus 1 all divided by t squared. And yes, you can algebraically make that look a whole lot better, but you don't have to. Just be sure that you use sufficient parentheses to make it work. Basically, you're going to need to set your numerator off is going to be the biggest thing. 
Okay? That's about as ugly as it could get. And believe it or not, exponential and logarithmic functions do come up a lot in business, especially if you're modeling data. Exponential growth and decay and their inverse logarithms are functions where you either start out low and go high, that's called exponential growth, or you start out high and go low, and that's called exponential decay. And the logarithms are just simply more like that. They go that way. So they level out too, but they level out at the top. So this one says Kelly Blue Book has, according to the Kelly projections from Kelly Blue Book, the value, resale value of a 2014 Toyota Forerunner will be approximated by this function, which is a log function and T is the number of years since 2014. Find and interpret F of four and F prime of four. F of four is that. And just as a little aside, since this is basically a function that has this constant here where if um, t were equal to zero, that's probably the sale price of the car new. Okay? But they want to know what if it's four years old. So we're going to plug in four years. That's just an arithmetic problem. So what that means is And in 2018, the car's resale value is going to be about $19,798. Okay? But then F prime of T is the rate of change. How fast is its value depreciating?
So f prime of t is going to be, let's see, the derivative of the 3781 is zero minus, that constant is just going to sit there. And we're going to need the natural log of 10, since that's a base 10 logarithm. times the 0.46t plus 1 in the denominator and the derivative of the 0.46t is going to be 0.46. So f prime of t would be the 24277 times 0.46 And since we want to find f prime of 4, then we're going to replace t with 4. So we'll do a little more arithmetic. I think I need an extra set of parentheses there. Because otherwise it would take the answer and divide it by the natural log and then divide that answer by the last one and I don't want it to do that. So that turns out to be $1,707.73. And what that means is that the car's losing resale value at the rate of about $1,707 a year. Because your derivative is your rate of change in the resale value. Does that make sense to everybody?
I'm increasing X because I want you to see that eventually the car becomes pretty much valueless. And eventually it has a negative value. As you can see that its resale value is decreasing all the time. But the slope of this function is always going to be decreasing. Okay? Something's not right there. Because that's not giving me the right F4 value. Let me make sure I type that in right. Close the parentheses, but that shouldn't matter. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that, that would make a huge difference. Okay. So that means I need my window. There we go. Takes a lot longer for it to be worthless, so. And that's a lot more like it. Okay. Just about done. In fact, that was it. I forgot I stuck all this other stuff under there. So there's your last problem. Does anybody have any questions, concerns? While you're out, since y'all are going to be using this kind of as a study guide, I'm going to put it on Shoby, but there's a couple of things I'd like to talk to you about that I think will help you on your own until I get it up there. Because there's some real common, some of the things that you missed were a, a, a misunderstanding, I think, of what I was asking. <clears throat> And if you don't still have your formula sheet, let me know and I will print you another one. Because one of the things that you should have gotten is this right here, the test for continuity. Because there was a direct question about the test for continuity. So most everybody got that problem right. 
and there wasn't any work to show me. All you basically had to do was just read the table and realize that that limit was going to eight. But on this problem, what that actually means, that limit as x approaches negative one from the negative side, means what is the limit approaching as you come at it from this direction? And as you come at it from that direction, it's approaching the y value of negative two. Whereas if you approach it from the right, like part b, that means that you're backing up toward two from the positive side or toward negative one, and that actually comes out at positive two. And then on part C, that limit as X approaches negative one does not exist because part A comes down here and part B comes up here and they don't meet. The left and the right hand limit have to meet. They have to be equal for the limit to exist at that number. And then I ask you at this point, what was G of negative one? And I was surprised at the number of people that told me it was two because it's not, it's negative two. And then when I ask you, is g of x continuous at x equals negative one? Continuity, a function f is continuous at a number if f of c is defined. Okay, yes, it was. f of negative one was negative two. If the limit as x approaches that number exists, it did not. So the answer to this question was, no, it is not continuous. And it's not because it jumps or because you had to pick up your pencil. It's because the limit in part C did not exist. Okay? That was the reason. This problem... Most of you got this one right. All you had to do was factor, factor the numerator, cancel out common factors, and then you would get an equivalent expression that was x minus nine. And if you plugged in negative nine to x minus nine, you got negative 18. So most people got that right. This is the one where you have a limit as x approaches infinity. And the trick on that one is that you have to divide everything numerator and denominator every term by the highest power of x in the denominator. So that turned out to actually be four over four minus x over eight. And the derivative as x approaches infinity of x over eight goes to zero. So it was just four over four one. And like I said, most people got that one right. This is very similar to the problem on the first page. The only difference here is I'm asking you to approach four. And if you approach four from the negative side, that goes to infinity, positive infinity. If you approach four from the positive side, it goes down forever and that's negative infinity. So once again, the limit as x approaches four did not exist. Not only that, but f of four was undefined. And so for that reason, it is not continuous at x equals four just because f of four is not defined. It failed the first continuity test. A lot of people got this one right, the ones that didn't get it right did not take the derivative because you have to use the definition of the derivative to do that. And the definition of the derivative says that you take 72 over x plus h minus 72 over x, find a common denominator and then divide the whole thing by h and factor out the h and you'll get the derivative. The derivative turns out to be 72 over x squared. A lot of people got, got the answer to that one right, but they messed up on explaining to me what it means. 
piece of paper. So we have all this very, I mean, it's very important. Part of it, yeah. And I tried to make the problems worth more if they took another look. Like this one was worth five points for each part because they took some work. This one? Number six, five points for A and five points for B. Actually, I think I'm just going to print the test. Now, a lot of people got this one right because the answer comes out to be when you do the rate of change, you've got 2,000 to 2040, so the change in X is going to be 40. And you have to estimate what it was in 2000 and what it was in 2040. And in 2040, it was about 11. And in 2000, it was about 4.5, although I gave credit for people that called it 4 or 5, either one. So 11 minus 4.5 was 6.5. And it turned out to be about 0.1625. Some people got a little more. Some people got a little less. I looked at what you thought these points were. And, uh, you know, as long as it wasn't totally ridiculous, then I gave you credit for your number. But that's not a percent. Read your graph. This is the number of people age 65 and over with Alzheimer's disease in millions. So that rate of change was 0.1625 million people per year from 2000 to 2040. The interpretation was what was most important on that. None of this is any good if you can't apply it to anything. This one I asked you about the instantaneous rate of change in 2020. And all you have to do to get an instantaneous rate of change is to sketch a short tangent line and use the closest points that you can estimate off of on the graph. And this one is about 4, and this one is about 7. Although, again, I took anything that anybody thought was reasonable that did it that way. And in 30 minus 2010, that's 20 years. You have 7 minus 4, which is 3.
or about 0.15. And again, There was one on either the test or the practice Is there test. A way to do that? Mm -mm. There was one either on the test or the practice test where that's what you had to do. And I tried to give you a better graph than the one that was on the practice test because the one that was on the practice test was hard to read. So this one was really a lot easier probably than you thought it was. Okay, so that means that. Again, here they're increasing by 0.15 million people per year in 2020. That's projected change. This one was worth 10 points and the answer was not two. If you take the limit of this function, you want to check it at x equals 1 and you want to check it at x equals 2. So you take it as x approaches 1 from the negative and as x approaches 1 from the positive, which means you use this function and you get 0. And then you use this function and you get 2. And 2 does not equal 0, so it's not continuous. At x equals 1. But it is continuous at x equals 2 because if you take the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative, you get 2. And if you take the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive, which is this rule, you get 4 minus 2 and that equals 2. And 2 does equal 2, so it's continuous. Okay? This one was very much like... Where's the first one? Very much like this one. Only I was asking you to find the equation. So it turns out that at x equals 2, you have the point negative 2, 12. And I think at x equals 6, it was 532, I think was what it came out. Was it? No, it was negative 532. So you just find the slope. And it turned out that the slope was negative 68. And then when you find the equation of the secant line, you're using y equals mx plus b. Your slope is negative 68. The easier point to use is the negative 2 and 12. So it turns out that B was equal to negative 124. And then because you actually have the function here, granted it was a little ugly, which is why I made it worth so many points, so I could give you partial credit, you need to find the equation of the tangent line. First thing you got to find is the derivative. <coughs> and then once you find the derivative, that's equal to the slope, and you've still got that first point. 
to use y equals mx plus b and find me the equation. Okay? We'll come back to this one. A lot of people got this. Because all I'm asking you here for the marginal revenue function is R prime of X. I gave you the best 10 I could. Use the four step process to find your derivative. And then I said find and interpret the marginal revenue when 1,000 is spent and people that got this blew this. Even though all you had to do was plug in a number into R prime. Because you didn't read your problem. You have to read your problem, watch your units. And then interpreting it meant that revenue was declining, I think it was, by something like $44 at that point. Okay? So hopefully, without me even getting the Shobi out there right away, you've got that. This I will go over and show me in great detail. But this, use that rule for continuity. You have to go back to that formula sheet I gave you and use the rule for continuity to answer that. Can you print me out the formula sheet? Hmm? Can you print me out the formula sheet? Sure. There, I've got them folded where the scores aren't showing. I know it doesn't really matter because we're taking it over, but did you say that was worth 10 points? Because I was just making sure I didn't do anything wrong. <coughs> Uh, let me look. I don't think it was worth 10. Yeah, it doesn't matter if we're making it down right. Number seven. seven. Yeah, it was worth 10 points. Yeah, I gave you credit for this. But I didn't give you the other five because you didn't tell me why it was yeah, okay. discontinuous. This is the one that you have for exam one. This is the one I use for the final exam, but it's got like every. I believe mine was returned to you by mistake. Hmm? My formula sheet. I think it probably was. Um, let me print you one off. 
You didn't have one? Mm -mm. Oh. Yeah, I was like, I couldn't remember. I wish you'd said something. I didn't want to say anything because I didn't know if you gave the other class that or not. No, I gave everybody that. You got the same one they did, I thought. No, I didn't get any of them. The only thing I got was when I gave them back to you. Okay. Sorry. No, it's okay. That's right. I'm going to go on. Yeah, you might have done a lot better if you had formula. I would have done a lot better if I had formula. Oh, yeah. Here. This is the one she'll have at the end. The book of formula sheets. I do have one after all. That's the one you had for the test. Mm -hmm. okay. formula sheet to the test when I send it. Okay. Because uh, I want to make sure you've got the right one. Yeah, I know they look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of uh, the other professors didn't. And whenever I got into it, I was like, are we supposed to use this? They said, well, we can't let you use this. They didn't yeah, use this side. Yeah. No, I always attach everything, including instructions. She can use a calculator, she can use this, she can't use that. I mean, I try to be real specific because I know they're very, very, well, and I don't blame them because, you know, they don't know what you can and can't do. Yeah. They don't teach class. Exactly. So I always try to be real specific when I do it. Yeah. Well, I'll see you later. Okay. Hmm. I got four of them done on that. Um, the mm -hmm. It's too hard. I think tonight what you explained, the time you explained them, I think it'll help me just finish that quiz out instead of having to go and do all the homework. Okay. Um, so hopefully that'll work. But I have a midterm for a biology. I don't understand why. That's the only class I've ever had midterm uh -huh. in. Like ever. Well, I know biology is always given a midterm. A lot of times they only give a midterm and a final. No, they give us, he gives us midterms and finals. Like, it, nobody else has ever given me a midterm this whole two years here. Oh. Well, I, I know in biology, though, did he not do it last semester? Yeah, he did last. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, biology. Besides biology, that's it. Yeah, biology, I think, I don't know if physics does or not, but I know biology does, and it seems like chemistry does. They get a midterm and a final. It, like, I don't know. You would think Englishes would, um, well, literature. Well, they really don't because they make you write papers. 